So Romans chapter 7, well, we're going to look at verses 11 through 13 today. You recall from our, our last lesson, we talked about really how sin works through the law and brings about death in us, both spiritually and physically. And he's, uh, on that same thought here, we found on a little more. So some, I said some people argue that this is speaking of a, the age, excuse me, age of accountability. That once you be, once you became old enough to understand, then you died spiritually. Some think it's speaking of really the original sin in the garden. How do we in Adam we we die? <clears throat> Certainly that is true. But I think he was specifically talking about his own life and how that before the Lord saved him, he was thought himself to be alive in the law as a, a Pharisee, as a, a good Jew. Yeah, and his understanding was. Illuminated when his eyes, spiritual eyes, were open, and he really saw himself for what he was. Amen. And that's really what true salvation requires: seeing yourself for what you are, mm -hmm. what you deserve. But he goes on in verse number eleven here, and he says, "For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, <clears throat> deceived me, and by it slew me." Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Amen. So here he begins verse 11, the same as he did verse number 8. But for sin taking occasion by the commandment. Sin, like I said, it always corrupts and always leads to more and more corruption. Yeah, that. That's the point he's building up to here at the end of our lesson. But if you recall last time I mentioned how it's like a like a cancer or almost it's left untreated. It was growing more and more. I'm sure, Brother Larry and Brother and Sister Don knows who are involved in medicine can tell you better, but cancer left untreated doesn't just go away on its own usually. Right. Unless the Lord heals you, then it takes medical treatment. And just, just the same as it is with a, a piece of machinery, if it begins to rust, your old car begins to rust or something, if you don't take care of that rust, it'll just spread more and more and eventually eat up that whole piece of equipment. Right. And that is how cancer works. It doesn't just go to a certain point and stop. It continues until it consumes the whole whether it be an individual or a church, a nation, a society. We see over and over again that's exactly how sin works unless it's dealt with. But he says, for sin taking occasion by the commandment, that is the, the law or the commandment as it's called here, gave sin the opportunity to show itself for what it really is. He says it deceived me. It is, sin is deceptive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It often looks good to the flesh, but we know that sin never brings about anything good. Right. If we can go really all the way back to the garden, that's exactly what happened with Eve. She looked upon the tree and saw it was good for to eat, didn't she? After the serpent had said, You shall not surely die. Right. You know, in fact, the same word to see here is used in 2 Corinthians 11 3. We'll turn there, but when Paul says that the serpent beguiled Eve in the garden, <laughs> see, sin does the same thing as it always has, though. Ever since then, ever, even to now, until Christ returns, sin will always deceive men. Amen. And it will look good, it will entice men, <coughs> maybe offer pleasure for a little while, but. Sin itself is not good, you can be sure of that. In fact, what is it? James 1.14 says that every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Mm -hmm. That's, we get attracted by it, don't we? We 
it looks good, it gets our attention, then we begin to think about, well, maybe it won't hurt just a little bit. Right. And what we think, well, I can just get this close and I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. and yet we, what we don't realize is that sin will take us a lot farther than we want to right. admit that it will. You know what it, it would be like if you went to the edge of a cliff, you don't, me personally, I wouldn't stand all the way at the very end with no, no guardrail, nothing to keep me from falling. Right. Yeah, we do that with sin, don't we? We act like we get just as close as possible. Yeah. And it, since Brother Adam likes to bring up my story of shocking myself there at his house. <laughs> so I, once I figured out that, that was live current running through there, it wouldn't have been smart for me to keep going back and touching it over and over again. Right. We do the same type of thing with sin, don't we? <laughs> well, it won't hurt me again this time. Oh, hurt again this time. Yeah. It's like we never seem to learn our lesson because sin deceives us. It is very deceptive in its appearance. Right. And we certainly can't blame Satan for our actions. But I'm sure sometimes he helps that deception along. You know, it just. It says here that it deceived me and by it slew me. Amen. It is sin always ends in death, doesn't it? Mm hmm That's always the end result of sin. In fact, uh, I quoted James 1.14, James 1.15 goes on to say, Thus when that conceived bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. We all know Romans 6.23 that the way to the sin is death, the gift of God eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That sin will most certainly kill you, both physically and spiritually. Mm -hmm. Now, if we have been born again, it cannot take that eternal life away from us, but it certainly can <laughs> separate us in our fellowship from God. But if you're not saved here, you can be sure that it's sin that completely separates you from God. Mm -hmm. Because this flesh has not been perfected yet, it will one day die because sin still dwells in it. Mm -hmm. Sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Was, sin has always been the cause of death, going all the way back to the beginning. That's why <clears throat> evolution cannot be compatible with the scriptures because Amen. sin came by direct result of Adam's sin in the garden. So death is passed upon all and for all of sin, Romans 5 tells us. Amen. He says that he doesn't say here that the commandment or the law was, was the cause of death, rather it is sin that is the cause of our death. The law prescribes the punishment for breaking it, but the law itself is not what causes death. That's what he'll kind of get into in our next verse here, or verse 13 really. But he says in verse 12, wherefore, or for this reason, he says the law is holy. It is because of the law does not produce death, but rather sin in us is what produces death. He says the law is holy, or it's, it's pure, it's blameless, it's sacred, if you will. Mm -hmm. Really, the law is holy because it comes from a holy God. Amen. So, uh, the natural man looks at the law and is really disgusted by it, isn't he? Says, well, I don't want to have to do that, or I, I want to be able to do this thing, or I don't understand why God won't let me do this, but yet, the law is holy in every aspect of, of it. So because it comes from God who himself is holy. Amen. Moses didn't make up the law. He didn't just write, sit down one day and decide, well, I don't want the Israelites to commit fornication, so I'm going to write that down. He didn't say, well, I don't want them to worship all these other gods, so I'm going to decide that they have to worship Jehovah and only Jehovah. Mm -hmm. 
Lord. The law came down from God Himself. Amen. And because of that, it is completely pure, and even if the natural man does not like it, you know, we could we could get into what was specific to the Israelites and what was part of the ceremonial law, the moral law. But that's not really what we're after today. Paul seems to address the moral law here as he talks about primarily lust and covetousness, which really, from what I could read, the Jews thought that was really the basis of all the other sins. That lust it begins with lust and then it grows into other things, and that's how James describes it. Describes it too that. Lust when has conceived brings forth sin. Amen. And so those evil desires within us that bring about all those other sins. He says the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. And the commandment is holy just that is each and every command of the law is holy. But not just the law as a whole, but each individual part of it as well. He says it's holy and it's just. That is, it, it comes from that which is morally right and good. It's righteous, you could say. And it's just in all its demands as well. Amen. And some think it's, the law is not fair in its dealing, but yet it is very fair, isn't it? Or rather, we should say it's very just. Amen. Because fair would just send us all straight to hell. Right. Well, the law, he says, it's also good. You know, that it means pleasurable, desirable, the high standard. It means really what we would think of as good. The commandment is good primarily because it comes from God, who is also good. But it is good for us as well, isn't it? You know, we might not like the law in our natural flesh, but yet we might not always like the commands of God, but yet they are good for us. Amen. They are just in what they tell us to do and not to do, and they are the holy as well. They are, and the commandments of God are not grievous, First John writes for us. The reason, really, that the law and the commandments are just and holy and good is because they come from God, who is all those things. Amen. We don't have to turn, but Psalm 99, verse 9, tells us that God is holy. Psalm 100, verse 5, tells us that the Lord, He is good. Amen. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, tells us that He is just and right. And God is holy and just and good. Therefore, his law and his commandments are holy and just and good. Amen. He said he cannot be any of those things because they are a violation of the law. That's where we don't need to confuse the law with sin. I, mean, I don't think any of us do that literally, but the law itself was not bad. Amen. The law itself is not the cause of our sin. The law is not the cause of death and suffering. Rather, the sin through the law is what causes all these things. When God originally gave one law or one commandment to Adam and Eve, or at least specifically to Adam. He was the one held responsible. But Amen. Just not to eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yet that law, that commandment, it was holy and just and good, wasn't it? You know, it was the violation of that law that brought about all that is not good. It brought about wickedness and sin in our lives, and in the whole world, and eventually to us in 2024. Sin is the transgression of the law, according to First John chapter five. Amen. Sin is also that which is not of faith, according to later on here in Romans and 
James chapter 5 tells that to know to do good and to do not that is sin. At least sin is the opposite of holy and just and good. He, because he calls it good here, he knows that some are going to object to that. So in verse 13, we'll continue on. He, he says, Was then that which is good made death of them? Look at the law and it's all that how it condemns us and they say, well it's the law is the reason I must die. But really the law is not the reason we must die. It's that sin nature that's in us. Amen. The law just shows us our sinfulness. As he'll say here, God forbid, or absolutely not. It's in fact the opposite is true, I believe, that the law is not what causes our sin, the law is not what causes death and suffering, but rather as I said, the violation of the law. It's that sin that we have within us, that is what causes death and suffering. Mm -hmm. Is that sin nature that we are all born with it makes us be born separate and apart from God. Amen. And it's individual sins in our own life which separate us from God as well. And our, as we walk with him. Well, Isaiah chapter 59 tells us that the Lord's hand is not short and that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear, but our transgressions have separated between you and your God. Amen. It's not that God cannot hear us, it's not that God cannot save today, it's not that he can't deliver us from our troubles, but it's rather we have sin that is separating us in that fellowship with him. But was, was that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. He says, but sin. So once again, we see sin. Sin is always what corrupts. Death is the result of sin and only of sin. Mm -hmm. So we cannot make God the author of death because sin came about because of our sin. I mean, so we death came about because of our sin. Amen. Now, certainly, God has numbered our days, and certainly, He knows the day when we be born, the day when we shall die, and mm -hmm. He is in control of all those things. But death did not proceed, or not proceed from that which is good. Amen. Death proceeded from. Really our sinfulness. And he says, but sin that it might appear sin, as that it might show itself for what it is. It is good. That is, sin produces death, but it's doing it through the commands, because because the law demands perfect obedience. Well, sin takes hold and then it produces death in us by the violation of the law. That is, the law demands perfection, doesn't it? Amen. Yet when we violate that law, it demands death as a result. That's because of the sin that is within us. Because the, the law is not in the wrong year, one in the wrong. Mm -hmm. The law is just the means by which sin produces its effects. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 and 56 tells us the strength of, this, of sin is the law. But one day that will be not needed anymore, will it? But until then, he says this at the end of our text here, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Mm -hmm. is the law, the commandment, it will show us exactly how great a sinner we are and how wicked sin really is. Look up, the law was to be our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Amen. 
was to show us how wicked, ungodly, and sinful we really are. It illuminates, if you will, and shines light on sin and what sin really is. The law itself is not a bad thing. Mm. It's when we violate the law of God. Going back to my example, shocking myself there at Adam's house, that electrical panel was not, wasn't in the wrong with me touching it. Right. And yet, just as, as dumb as it would be for me to go back and touch it again and again and then get mad at the electric currents for shocking me, we do the same thing with sin in the law, don't we? Mm, right. When we go back to it over and over again, then we act as if the commandment is to blame. God, if you hadn't just made, if you hadn't said to not do this, then it wouldn't be a problem. Mm. God, if you hadn't said that we have to do this, then I wouldn't have this issue. Yet we just, the law itself is not the problem. We are always the problem. Our sin nature is what needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. See, sin has always been the problem, all the way back to the garden. It will continue to be the problem until, really until Christ returns and makes all things new, as the psalmist said. Or as 1 Corinthians 15 says, that he will, death will be swallowed up in victory. Mm -hmm. He says, then he says, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of that, the sin, the strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, one day Christ will defeat the last enemy. Death will be no more, sin will be no more. <clears throat> and we'll be in that perfect body free from sin. But until then, this constant struggle of sin will be in us. And that's what we're going to begin seeing here in the next few verses at the end of the chapter. Or Paul begins to describe his struggle with wanting to do good and doing not, <laughs> doing that which he doesn't want to do. Any person who is truly striving to serve God will know of that struggle. Mm -hmm. Amen. See, a nominal Christian doesn't know of that struggle because they're content just doing the bare minimum. Or some of them even just content being in sin and pretending to be a Christian. Right. Well, the unsaved, they certainly don't know that struggle because they are still under, under the dominion of sin and have no real desire to serve God. Right. Someone who is born again and trying to serve God, you'll see that struggle. You want to do good and you end up finding yourself not doing good. You'll, you'll want to serve God faithfully and you'll find yourself struggling with sin. Mm -hmm. and I think if even Paul himself struggled greatly with that. I don't think any of us can say that we're above that either. Amen. I'm not going to get too often ahead of ourselves, but that's why I don't, I don't buy this uh, Pentecostal type progressive sanctification where you can come to the point of sinless perfection in this life. But Paul himself hadn't came to that point. And yet, Amen. I don't think any of us are any better servant of God than Paul was. Mm -hmm. well, the problem is we are we're still carnal. We still have this sinful nature to deal with. Until that is put off completely, then we will still struggle with sin. That's right. But I will add as a closing that doesn't excuse our sin. We still will stand before God accountable for it. Amen. Because that law that we are is, it is holy and just and good, and God will certainly hold us to that standard. We can only cry what well, Christ has done for me. Amen. Let's close with that thought.